Please be seated, please. Mr. Prince. Thank you. All right, so I don't know anything about any Shakespeare. I can barely keep track for my kids of uh, redfish, bluefish. So I'm just going to talk about the court's instructions, how they apply to the evidence in the case, and then we'll focus on the evidence in the case. I don't have any uh, clever rhetorical devices for you, and I can't rhyme very well. So let's just talk about um, how to frame the question that you're here to answer first. I think that's the best place to start. Anytime you have to look at a, a variety of issues and a variety of complex evidentiary topics like we do in this case, I think it's important to first start by identifying the question it is that you have to answer. You've heard the state ask a lot of times as the evidence was presented in the case, in my version of the events possible, in my version of the events possible, in my version of the events possible. That's what a defense attorney is supposed to say, right? As the judge instructed you at the beginning of the trial, the state, ha the state has the sole and exclusive burden to prove with evidence each element of the offense beyond and to the exclusion of a reasonable doubt. And so as we go through, we're not talking about questions pertaining to belief. A lot of times the state tries to, to frame their arguments in terms of what do you believe, who do you believe? While it's important to answer those questions, the ultimate question you have to answer is not one of belief. Um, a lot of times, uh, and I don't know if Mr. Fuchs will reference it, but there's a part of your jury instructions which Judge Hankinson read to you that says you may rely on your own conclusions about the credibility of a witness, a juror may believe or disbelieve all or any part of the evidence or testimony of any witness as a means of suggesting that the standard is belief. Well, if the standard was belief, then the question would just be, what do you think happened, right? That's not what Judge Hankinson instructed you. The question about, or, or the, the instruction about believing witnesses and disbelieving witnesses, that has to be read within the context of the evidentiary standard that applies in the case. And what the judge told you about the evidentiary standard that applies in the case is that the defendant has entered a plea of not guilty. This means that you must presume or believe that the defendant is innocent. The presumption stays with the defendant as to each material allegation in the indictment unless it has been overcome by and to the exclusion of and beyond a reasonable doubt. So the, the question that you're ultimately answering here is one of exclusion. What that means for purposes of your evidentiary analysis is, is that the state's witnesses and the defense witnesses are not on equal footing, at least insofar as the state's witnesses carry with them the state's burden of proof. And what I mean when I say that is that for state witnesses, belief is a threshold question. Only if you believe them can you go on to decide whether their, their testimony, the evidence that they've presented, proves the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Whereas with defense witnesses, you may not believe them, but you may find that because they've taken the stand and testified, their testimony has given rise to a doubt which is not speculative and not imaginary, but is rather reasonable and therefore must be excluded affirmatively by the state. And so what, what, what that effectively means is you analyze the evidence that's been put before you and as you try to apply the, the instructions that the judge has given you to the case. To be clear, you could believe a state witness and still find that their evidence fails to exclude every reasonable doubt. Similarly, you could not believe a defense witness, but still find that that witness, his testimony or her testimony, gives rise to a reasonable doubt. So in the context of your analysis here, what does reasonable doubt mean? Remember we talked in jury selection about how reasonable outside these walls just means what do I think is probably true. The reasonable doubt in here has a very specific legal definition, okay? Uh, as the judge instructed you, reasonable doubt is not a mere possible doubt, a speculative doubt, an imaginary doubt, or a forced doubt. So when a doubt is not speculative and a doubt is not imaginary, I would suggest to you that the only rational way to interpret that instruction and apply it to the case is to take it to mean evidence-based doubt. And, and the, the example that I like to give jurors uh, to assist them in applying that instruction to the facts of the case is as follows. If this were a bank robbery trial, right? And the state puts on witnesses to say, I saw the defendant, they put on a video that shows somebody that looks exactly like the defendant committing the bank robbery, and the defense attorney stands up in closing argument and says, well, what if he has an identical twin? Right? That's a speculative, imaginary doubt. It's not based on evidence, it's based on argument. On the other hand, if the defendant in that armed robbery case takes the stand, testifies in his own defense that I do have an identical twin brother, that may or may not be true, but then it becomes incumbent on the state to disprove that or exclude that 
evidence-based doubt with evidence of their own. And that's an important distinction to make. What does it mean to exclude every reasonable doubt? There are instructions that give you guidance as to how the state must go about the, the task of trying to meet their burden. One of the instructions the court gave, gave you says that the presumption of innocence stays with the defendant as to each material allegation in the indictment unless it has been overcome by the evidence to the exclusion of and beyond a reasonable doubt. Another instruction in the uh, rules for deliberation section says this case must be decided upon the evidence that you have heard from the testimony of the witnesses and have seen in the form of exhibits and evidence. So what does that mean as a practical matter? That means that the state can't overcome evidence-based doubts, that is non-speculative, non-imaginary doubts, which I would submit under the instructions that have been provided means a reasonable doubt. The state can't overcome reasonable doubts with argument. Now, I'll give you a, an example of where that's going to apply down the road as we go through the evidence here. There's been a lot of talk already about Marquise Davis. Marquise Davis says that he took Brandy Peters' food at, or at around 7.30, fed the kids around 7, 7.30 as well. There's absolutely no evidence that is even inconsistent with his testimony. And introducing evidence inconsistent with his testimony is not the state's burden. When a doubt arises from the evidence, they have an obligation to affirmatively come forward with evidence, not argument, and exclude the reasonable doubt created by that evidence. We can use the, uh, the hypo hypothetical that Mr. Fuchs used in jury selection to illustrate this point. In jury selection, he was talking about how, well, if, if you're trying to decide beyond a reasonable doubt, if your fr friend drove himself over to your house and you answer the door and he's standing there and you see a vehicle that you think is his in the driveway, maybe it is reasonable to think that he drove himself there. The question's not, is the state's version of the events reasonable? The state's burden is, have they excluded every other reasonable doubt? And if you've noticed, the judge didn't instruct you that the state gets the benefit of any inference, presumption, or assumption. They don't. The defendant is presumed innocent, as we've already talked about. So in the case of the hypothetical Mr. Fuchs used, let's say somebody comes and testifies, hey, I checked the VIN or I checked the license plate on that vehicle, and that actually is your friend's. Well, that's a good piece of evidence to start with, but it doesn't prove he drove, and you're not allowed to give the state the benefit of any presumption. Let's say a witness comes and testifies. Well, I saw him get out of the driver's seat. That's extra evidence. That's good, right? But what if that witness is biased? What if that witness has a, a grudge against the defendant? Those are just examples of things that you have to analyze, okay? So hopefully, as we discuss those things just a little bit briefly here, it, uh, it gives you some practical idea about how you should go about applying the instructions that the court has given you to the facts of this case. The last thing we need to talk about from the preliminary instructions before we jump in to the evidence itself is the question about how a reasonable doubt arises. And the instruction on that issue says that a reasonable doubt as to the guilt of the defendant may arise from the evidence, conflict in the evidence, or a lack of evidence. And we're going to kind of deal with those in reverse order, starting with lack of the evidence. Before we do that, though, I, I just want to clarify so that the issues before you are clear uh, what we don't have to decide. You don't need to decide whether this is a lesser included offense. This is premeditated, first degree murder, a death penalty offense for sure. If this isn't, nothing is, right? This is the worst offense ever committed in this town. The people who committed this offense are the most evil people who have ever come through this town. So skip past that part when you get to the jury instructions. It is first degree premeditated murder without a doubt, right? The other thing you can consider is that, uh, or, or I should say that you don't have to consider here, is whether it's justifiable or excused. It's obviously not. There's no, no excuse for drowning children, shooting children, beating and shooting Brandy Peters. So just go to the question that's actually at issue, which is the identification of the person or people who committed the, these offenses. I think it's best to start now that we're going to start talking about the evidence at the place that I started an opening statement, and that's with motive. And we're talking about motive now in the context of a lack of evidence. Nothing about the state's case doesn't make, make sense if the motive doesn't make sense. Okay? In order for the, the evidence that they put on regarding the person who committed this offense to make sense, there's got to be a motivation. Now, that's not an element of the offense as instructed by the court, but it is a necessary logical step to get to those elements. Right? Nothing else makes sense if there's not a palatable motive here. Mr. Fuchs starts off talking about how 
Mr. Segura must have been afraid of jail and driver's license suspension, professional licensure suspension, wage garnishment, tax refund, liens, international travel ban. That argument completely ignored what the evidence actually was. Because what the evidence actually was, was that Mr. Segura was already subject to every single one of those consequences. His baby mama, Tamika Hawkins, who does not like him, did not want to testify for him, did testify for him, and would have testified here again live if not for a personal medical issue. And what she testified to was that she had already sent him to jail and he figured out how to get out by making partial payments. She had already got his license, his driver's license suspended. He had already figured out how to get re it reinstated by making partial payments. He worked jobs where no professional license was required. Instead, he just took a skills test at the beginning of each job. He avoided wage garnishment by working as an independent contractor and working out of state. She testified that that made it effectively impossible to garnish, garnish his wages. She already had a tax lien in place. Anytime he got a tax refund, it was already going straight to Tamika Hawkins. And on, in addition to that, she already had a child support judgment of a sufficient amount to keep him from traveling internationally. Mr. Fuchs gets up here and talks about he wants to go to Afghanistan. He's worry, worried about his uh, wages getting garnished. All that stuff was already in place. So what are we talking about here? If there's no additional consequences beyond, you know, a couple of extra hundred dollars a month, is that really a motive to kill a mother and three children? I would submit that that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And remember, the guy from DSF that they called, the Department of Financial Services that they called in, went through each of those consequences and acknowledged that if there was already a child support judgment in place, Mr. Segura would already be subject to all of those consequences. The other thing that I want you to think about there is that Mr. Segura already knew exactly what to do about the arrearage judgment that had been placed upon him. What Tamika Hawkins said was that last time he got a child support judgment against him, it was in excess of $20,000. What did he do? Did he kill her? Did he kill his daughter? No. What he did was he went to court. Now, the state wanted to introduce evidence that said, oh, well, if he filed something with DCF, they were just going to ignore that and go forward. So what? They're not the court, they're not the final arbiter. He can file a petition with the court, like the DFS guy acknowledged, and he can go get a final determination from the court. The other thing that I would ask you to consider, and the, the state mentions this as an indication of motive, I would say that it is an indication of motive, but not motive to kill, but rather to legally deal with the problem. He had already started the process of contesting paternity because uh, Ms. Peters had left him voice messages saying that he wasn't the father. That process hadn't even worked through yet, right? Why is he going to go through the process at all of filing documents with the court, contesting paternity, if he's just going to kill everybody, right? It doesn't make any sense for him to cut that process short and just kill everyone when he may very well be able to get uh, paternity determined and, and get out from under the child uh, support judgment altogether. Even if paternity had been established, however, Tamika Hawkins told you what he did with the child support judgment last time he had it imposed against them. He went to court, he told the, the judge about the fact that he had bought diapers and made payments, and it got reduced from over $20,000 down to $9,000. When Mr. Segura testified here, he told you that in this case, he actually had receipts of payments and diapers and this kind of stuff, so he stood an even better chance of being able to get his uh, child support arrearage judgment reduced. And again, he already knew how to stay out of jail by making partial payments, keep his license by making partial payments, how to avoid garnishment by working out of state. His job didn't require a professional license. When you look at that and realize that all of the consequences that the state is suggesting as motivation were already in place, nothing about that motive theory makes sense. Tamika Hawkins' testimony absolutely eviscerates the foundation of their entire case. There's absolutely no additional sanction that Mr. Segura is facing as a result of this new child support judgment. The other thing I'd like to point out that the state conveniently ignored yet again, they didn't present it during their evidence, I had to extract it from Sergeant Corbett, so I'll mention it again. He's talking about all these text messages that Brandy Peters was sending, all these mean text messages, she's taunting him. Something changed in between then and Friday, didn't it? Y'all remember that? What changed? Brandy Peters sent him another text message after he came over there on Wednesday. And this is going to be a theme throughout my closing. Let's rely on Brandy to tell us things so we don't have to divine things for ourselves. Mr. Segura, we know, based on his phone records and his own testimony, went over and saw Ms. Peters on Wednesday, right? Sergeant Corbett said that the phone records showed that. 
after he goes over there on Wednesday, on Thursday at 9.58 a.m., he gets a text from Miss Peters. What's the tone of that text? Is she taunting him? Is she talking about child support? Is she saying she's going to have him put in jail? No, none of that. Her exact words were, you was looking good. If you wasn't my baby daddy, I would have given you some. LOL, exclamation point. Does that sound like somebody who's trying to mess with him, get him sent to jail, get his driver's, or does it sound like somebody who's been appeased by whatever conversation they had on Wednesday? That text right there, again, further serves to absolutely eviscerate the state's motive theory. Henry had dealt with Brandy. He went over there, and it's, it's like he said, they're like any other couple that, that has a sexual uh, relationship. They fight, they make up. They fight, they make up. That's part of the pattern of their relationship. And that's what happened here. That's what Miss Peters' own words indicate. And the phone records further suggest that Mr. Segura wasn't making up this story about going over to, to her house to have sex once he realized his initial lies to law enforcement weren't going to work. The phone records prove that what he's saying is true. They corroborate what he says. As soon as she sends him that text, what happens? They haven't been talking on the phone at all. Not in months. All of a sudden, she sends him that text. Boom. Two minutes later, one call. I can't talk right now. Call me back in a few minutes. He does. They talked for half an hour. Mr. Segura said when he testified that they were planning to hook up the next day, which would have been Friday. Friday, they have a couple conversations in the morning and then talk for an hour on the phone. Does that look like somebody when, again, they haven't talked in months. Does that look like somebody that's fighting or does it corroborate Mr. Segura's testimony that they're planning to hook up? As soon as they finish that conversation, around 11, 30, 12, whatever it was, you see Mr. Segura's phone travel into town. But when he gets to Brandy's house, she's not there, so he goes over to his sister Sean's house. Sergeant Corbett and Mr. Sawicki both agree that Sean's house is consistent with the phone records. Remember, when we, when we introduced those maps, we showed that he wasn't line jumping between Sector 2 and Sector 1 for a couple of hours there, between 1.30 or 1.41, I think it was, and about three o'clock. After that, he goes back over to Brandy's because she tells him she'll be home with the girls after she picks him up from school. The phone records are consistent with that too. After three o'clock, he starts sector jumping again because he's back up at that church parking lot where he told you he sat waiting for Brandy's mom to leave. Finally, he said she left around five o'clock. The phone records support that too. He's only, uh, he, he continues to line jump for a while there after he goes over to her house. Both of their phones then are inactive for about 25 minutes or so between about 5 o'clock and 525 while Mr. Segura says they have sex. So as we go through the, the rest of the evidence and talk about the motive, I want you to keep in mind that there is no evidence that supports the state's motive theory. Okay, that's, that's a big piece of missing evidence that I want you to keep in mind because nothing else makes sense without that. Another group of evidence uh, that I want to analyze under the lack of evidence prong of the analysis here is, uh, is the evidence from Jack McLean Park. If you could go to that first slide there. All right, so there was testimony about uh, a, a scene potentially connected to this murder at Jack McLean Park. I had to introduce that evidence, so those pictures are before you, and there's some other physical exhibits that we'll talk about in a little while here. Uh, the first thing that I'd like to talk to you about as it pertains to, to the question of whether Jack McLean is related to this murder is its proximity to Brandy's house. You can see from Sergeant Corbett's uh, maps that Jack McLean is a matter of a quarter mile or so away from Brandy's house. Um, now, another question is whether, the, uh, whether the, the trash can would have been changed out during the time between the murder and when it was discovered here six days later. I mean, I don't know if you, any of y'all have ever been to a city of Tallahassee Park I've never seen any park anywhere around here where the trash is changed every single day. And on top of that, this isn't, this isn't a trash can at the front of the park where people go all the time. This is when you go in the park there, I'm sure people are familiar with it, you turn to the right, you go all the way to the back of the park where there's a pavilion and there's a bathhouse. This ain't picnic season, right? It's the same date as it is right now, right? It's six days after this. The murder was today. The, the uh, Jack McLean scene was, was discovered six days later. So any, anybody out there having picnics, and remember this was also Thanksgiving week, right? So even if city workers would have normally been working, and even if city workers would have normally changed the trash can on a semi-regular basis, um, you know, there's no evidence that that, cert that that would have happened here. And what I would say beyond that is that if the state really believes that, 
rather than trying to suggest it indirectly through investigator Lewis's eye of training and experience about, nobody has training and experience about who changes trash cans, but okay, that's what you want to say, let's go with that. Why don't you just call the person who changes the trash can, right? You the partner with the burden of proof. If you want to exclude every reasonable doubt about whether this is related to the murder, why don't you just call the person who changes the trash can or get records from the city of Tallahassee to demonstrate that it was changed if you think that happened. They didn't do that. They don't have any evidence of that. They prefer to rely on conjecture. Another thing that I'd ask you to consider as it pertains to Jack McLean Park is that there is evidence of a crime recovered by FDLE experts here. First, Joellen Brown identified blood on one of the latex gloves that was found in this trash can. You can start going through there. Next slide. Next slide. So there's a bunch of latex gloves that were discovered in this trash can, I think five or six of them. They're in evidence. They're defense exhibits in this case. Joellen Brown discovered another set of gloves. There were seven gray gloves that she found. Some of those also had blood on them, if you recall. And I know you all were taking uh, thorough notes and were taking notes throughout the entire trial. Blood was also identified by FDLE expert Diane Guzman in 2018 when the collared shirt that was found there was tested for blood for the first time. Um, there was also a t-shirt with red-brown stains on it that we'll talk a little bit more in a little while. That one did test negative for blood, but you can see on it that there's a puncture wound from which the red-brown stains emanate. And as Joellen Brown said, if you set something on fire, uh, that can have the, uh, the potential to ruin DNA, and it, it may test negative after that. Um, another thing that I asked Investigator Lewis about was the fact that there was an empty box of shop towels found in and around this, and if you go through this. One thing that you'll notice is conspicuously absent from the trash itself, you can keep going, notice that in none of these pictures, are there any of these blue shop towels? Keep going. Go back one, please. That box right there is the, uh, the empty box of shop towels, and the only one you see in any of these pictures is right over there. Um, so there, you, know, you have a whole big box of, of shop towels. You can go to the next one. You got a whole big box of shop towels, but no, uh, uh, no shop towels to be found until you get inside here, go a little farther, and we see that somebody's been flushing them down the toilet. Now, is that by itself proved that this was necessarily a cleanup scene? No, but you got to take everything together, like Mr. Fuchs said. Uh, there was also a bleach bottle that was found at the scene. Now, I, I imagine that the state is going to try to suggest that perhaps all this stuff is from a janitor or something. But one thing that I would ask you to consider about that argument is as follows. Number one, we're not talking about a single set of gloves here or even a couple of pairs of gloves. This is one bathroom and like 14 different gloves or pairs of gloves here. You can get the exact number if you want to see them in evidence up there. Um, same thing for the gray gloves. Again, these are blood, some of these are bloody gloves, same as with the white latex gloves. And, uh, and there's multiple pairs of each. Um, again, the, there, there's an empty box of, of shop towels there, but no shop towels to be find, uh, found, indicating that they were flushed. And another thing that's uh, recognizable outside here, go to the next slide, keep going, is you'll find new clothing tags in and around the scene where all this stuff was found. Go to the next slide. Uh, another UPC code there indicating that, uh, that new clothing was purchased. Probably the most relevant thing and the best indicator, however, that this isn't anything that a janitor did is the point that Investigator Lewis begrudgingly admitted, which, which is that all of the garbage was set on fire, right? That's why it's all burned up, because somebody set it on fire. I doubt any janitor that's cleaning those bathrooms is going to do all the cleaning, get blood all over everything, and then set it all on fire unless it's evidence of a crime. That doesn't make sense. Now, another thing that you should consider about all this evidence, now having discussed what evidence potentially links it to this case and to this scene, the state didn't test the bloody collared shirt, which is also in evidence as a defense exhibit, for touch DNA, it only swabbed it for blood, until 2018, after Mr. Segura had been in custody for seven years. What that touch DNA uh, analysis uh, showed was that there was foreign male DNA at multiple locations upon the shirt, Mr. Segura was excluded from that touch DNA. To this day, the t-shirt that was discovered with red-brown stains on it has not been analyzed for touch DNA. To this day, 
The latex gloves that were discovered have not been swabbed for touch DNA to this day. The gray gloves that had blood on them have not been swabbed for touch DNA to this day. The bleach bottle that they found has not been swabbed for touch DNA. And the UPC codes that they found there were never followed up on either. Remember what Mr. Knox said a homicide detective or investigator can do when they get UPC codes close in time to when those items were pur purchased. They can go to the originating store and they can get video associated with that purchase. That would have been pretty good evidence, huh? I mean, wouldn't it have been pretty compelling if they'd gone to Walmart and got a video and it showed Mr. Segura, for example? That'd be an example of excluding reasonable doubt, right? But that's not what they did. They just left it sitting there on the garbage and took pictures of it. Now, another point that I want to talk about relative to the lack of evidence in this case is the lack of evidence connecting Mr. Segura to the actual crime scene on Saddle Creek. Um, Mr. Fuchs kept using the term uh, an, ab uh, an absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. I don't know what exactly that meant, and Joel and Brown didn't know exactly what that meant. Um, but I think it's important to focus on the phrase excluded here, because excluded is not an absence of evidence. Excluded means there is evidence, we can compare your profile to it, and it ain't you. That's what excluded means. So let's go through and talk about the DNA found at Saddle Creek that excludes Mr. Segura. There was DNA found under Brandy Peters' fingernails. That excluded Henry Segura. Uh, they never did bother to take any scrapings from underneath the children's fingernails. There was some testimony about the fact that they were short and what? You can't get dirt, grime, skin under short nails. I mean, it's certainly worth a try. They got it from underneath Brandy's nails and some of her acrylic nails were broken off. Uh, Henry was also excluded from the phone uh, from the DNA found on the phone cradle. That's an important point to realize. I know that there was some dispute about whether it's a Vila, whether it's not a Vila. Even in the best case scenario, and according to Kevin McElfresh, it isn't Henry's DNA and it isn't Javante's DNA, which means it's a foreign male's DNA on the phone cradle. Henry was also excluded. Actually, I'll go through and I'll give you the state's exhibits here in case you want to note that. So with the fingernail scrapings, that's going to be states 103C, H, and I. With the phone cradle, it's going to be states 35. The next item is the, uh, the DNA that was found on the phone cord, which is attached to the phone cradle we've been talking about. That's states exhibit 34. Henry was excluded from that DNA. The reason I'm talking about these surfaces in particular is because they have apparent connection to the murder. Remember, there's that big scuff mark on the wall by the phone. The phone cord is ripped out of the wall. The phone cord is cut in half. All of those are indications that, that that particular object, those particular objects are relevant to the murder investigation. So he was excluded from the phone cord as well. He was also excluded from the DNA mixture found on the projectile, which was recovered from the hall closet. That states exhibit 26. He was excluded from the DNA found on the shovel next to the victim's body. That states exhibit 76. Um, he was excluded from the phone plug in the kitchen, which I believe was also unplugged. That states exhibit 96. His DNA was excluded from the mixture found on the exterior of the purse. Remember, there was testimony that the purse was picked up, dumped out, all the contents were rifled through. He's excluded from that DNA. Uh, he's also excluded from having touched the contents of the, uh, of the purse. They took five swabs off of various places on Ms. Peter's wallet, and he was excluded from all of those except one where they could make de no determination because Javante's DNA was potentially included there. Um, he was excluded from the DNA mixture recovered from the blood droplet in the hallway at the entrance to the common bathroom. We were going kind of fast there, so I don't know if that testimony landed with anybody, but that's State's Exhibit 17. So there's a blood droplet on the carpet as you're going into the bathroom where the, where the children were found. The, the major contributor to that blood droplet was the twins. Uh, obviously, it's the twin who was shot, uh, Tamaya. Uh, but there was also a minor profile within that blood droplet. Uh, Mr. Segura was excluded from that blood droplet. Uh, that was State's Exhibit 17. Um, he was also excluded from surfaces around the bath bar, which we'll talk more about later uh, in great detail. Um, but let me just talk about some of the surfaces that were found in close proximity to the, to the bath bar uh, for your consideration as well. He was excluded from the DNA swab of the bathroom faucet in the common bathroom, that's state 61. He was excluded from the DNA on the swab, the swab of the flush handle in the common bathroom, that's state 65. He was excluded from the DNA uh, on the exterior doorknob for that bathroom. So that doorknob had to be opened. There's foreign male DNA there. Javante's excluded, Henry's excluded. 
Um, even on the blood smear on the back of the wall, where the uh, bath bar is, that's only Brandy's DNA. There's no minor profile. Um, he hasn't contributed to that at all. Now, we know that Henry was in fact there, so why are we talking about all these surfaces where there's no evidence of his DNA? Well, because we're talking about surfaces related to the murder, right? That's why he's not on these surfaces. If they had tested surfaces that were not relate, related to the murder, they may well have found touch DNA from him, for example. If they had tested the sheets in the bedroom, or if they had tested the pillowcases in the bedroom, if they had tested the couch cushions where he said he was sitting with the kids and Brandy, any of those places may well have yielded touch DNA, but understandably, that's not what they were looking for. They were looking for relevant information as it pertained to the murder. Another thing to keep in mind is that there was no blood transfer. Remember, I asked uh, Investigator Lewis about the fact that they had executed search warrants at Mr. Segura's house in each of his three vehicles. He had the white Monte Carlo, the green truck, and his wife's vehicle. Uh, and what Mr. Knox said is that anybody involved in perpetrating these murders would have been covered in blood spatter from Miss Peters. There would have been blood transfer in any vehicle that they rode in. Yet all of his vehicles were dirty, but without any evidence relevant to this case. That's one thing I'd like you to consider there. Another thing to consider um, as we're talking about the lack of evidence uh, at 908 Saddle Creek is uh, the lack of testing on the hairs. Now, I know you guys again were taking thrown notes, so you probably noted some of the hairs that they found didn't meet the criteria for DNA analysis, which is to say that they didn't have roots. Other ones did have roots and were capable of being analyzed but they didn't do that because Investigator Lewis or anybody else from the T Tallahassee Police Department didn't ask him to do that. Another important point I wanna make outside of the DNA uh, as it relates to the lack of evidence developed at the crime scene is the lack of evidence pertaining to the shoe impression and scuff marks. Again, Investigator Lewis said a search warrant was executed at Mr. Segura's house and upon all his vehicles that had access to or possession of every single pair of shoes he could have worn um, and they never bothered to gather or test any of them against the scuff marks that they recovered from the crime scene, uh, nor the shoe impressions that were identified at the crime scene. And then finally there again, they, uh, they had the ability to perform soil analysis on that shovel. Mr. Fuchs' suggestion was that, um, you know, perhaps that was something that, that the kids brought in. We'll talk more about that later when we're talking about um, some additional DNA analysis, but they didn't do the soil analysis. Certainly, if it revealed that there was soil consistent with coming from Brandy's backyard, that would undercut any argument that it could be potentially a, a calling card from actual Los Zetas cartel members or people, um, you know, for lack of a better expression, who want to be affiliated with them locally. Another thing that I think it's important to consider is the lack of injuries present on Mr. Segura. So Mr. Knox did indicate that Ms. Peters had a whole bunch of defensive wounds, um, but that she also had broken fingers and bruised knuckles and some of her acrylic nails were torn off. And remember what he said, he did this motion and said, uh, those indicate that she would have grabbed at her attackers um, and potentially sustained injuries to her hands doing that. Uh, and this was a dynamic and prolonged struggle. We know that also that she was scratching at at least one of the assailants because she had foreign female DNA discovered underneath her fingernails. Now the state suggests that maybe this is from a nail tech, um, but I would make a couple of points about that. First of all, you can't just say stuff like that when you're the party with the exclusive burden of proof. If you think that, why don't you go ask her sister who's sitting right over there where she gets her nails done at, and then go ask for buckle swabs from those folks. That would be a means of excluding every reasonable doubt. But they didn't do that, they just threw that suggestion out there uh, for you to consider. Another important point, relative to the possibility that the DNA under her fingernails is from a nail tech, is that the acrylic nails growing on top of her own nails have grown, grown out a discernible space there. What that obviously means, for I'm sure the, the female jurors who've gotten acrylic nails can explain to the nails, is that that acrylic nail has been on there for some time. It wasn't done within the last week or so. Um, it's been there for some longer period of time, which of course is also inconsistent with the state's suggestion on that point. Um, I think that it's also important to consider that we also have potential foreign blood spatter in the foyer of the house. Um, 
and that was discussed, uh, number one, on the tile next to Brandy's body. Each of them testified that there was a round blood droplet on the floor there um, that wasn't consistent with impact spatter coming from Ms. Peters, wasn't consistent with cast off from a weapon. And again, we also have foreign blood identified going into the, the common bathroom on the floor mixed with one of the, one of the twins' DNA right there. Um, that's important. That's important as it relates to the evidence found at Jack McLean Park because one of these sleeves here, on this sleeve here, you can see that there's a puncture wound, or rather a puncture to the, the cloth on the shirt, and that is the area from which these red-brown stains emanate. It's, uh, I would say, the, the most reasonable interpretation of that evidence in light of the blood droplets that we have on scene and the spatter analysis performed by the only people qualified to perform that, an that analysis in this case is that potentially one or more of the assailants had suffered injury during the attacks here and, uh, and were bleeding. Now, when you look at Mr. Segura, you can go to the, those pictures. When you look at Mr. Segura, there's no obvious injuries. There's no uh, visible injuries, and of course he's light complected. So if there were injuries consistent with having battled Brandy Peters, those would have shown up. You can go to the next one there. Again, no, no obvious injuries, certainly no injuries consistent with having been gouged by acrylic nails. He does have a few minor scratches, which you can barely see, of course. You can go to the next one. Same thing, go to the next one. All right, you can go back. None of those injuries are in any world consistent with having battled Brandy Peters and having been scratched. Um, those are consistent with exactly what he described, that he went to his buddy's house, he shot arrows, and he reached into the bushes uh, to, to go ahead and grab the arrows. I mean, you don't have to be a board-certified medical examiner to identify what looks like a scratch from reaching into a bush and what would look like a scratch from being gouged by a person with acrylic nails. I also want to talk about the lack of evidence supporting the state's theory about the time of death. So I would... Uh, I would direct your attention back to the fact that Officer Jernigan testified that Monica Peters told her on the morning of 11:20, when the bodies were discovered that she had last spoken to Brandy Peters at about 10 o'clock the night before. Now, although Monica Peters claimed that Brandy's phone, her home phone, was disconnected, the circumstantial evidence indicates that's not true. There's no reason why Brandy would have run to that home phone in the back of the house in her bedroom if the phone was disconnected. Um, Moreover, the, the assailants would not have had to yank the cord out of the wall, nor would they have had to cut it. If, however, you want to assert that, probably the best way to do it is to just get the phone records. We're sitting here nine years removed from the murder, and still the state doesn't have any phone records relating to Brandy Peters' home phone. If you wanted to exclude the reasonable doubt about whether Brandy was still alive at 10 o'clock, probably want to go ahead and get those records. We can also talk about Brandy's cell records. Mr. Fuchs stated in, in his first close that in the weeks leading up, to the murders, we can see that she's active on her phone. They didn't give you weeks, they gave you a week, one week, and this day is different than the other days. It's a holiday Friday, number one, and number two, we know that she has company, right? Mr. Segura's over there from like five o'clock to eight o'clock, 8.15, and then immediately after that, we know that she had another visitor in a dark colored SUV based on Marquise Davis' unrebutted testimony. Those two things distinguish this day from other days, and I would suggest if you really want to establish that there's actually a pattern of never being inactive for more than a couple hours, give us a month, give us two months. Call detail records are not like text records. They don't evaporate after a short period of time. You can go back and get call detail records back and back and back. Those records aren't in front of you. You got a week. So that's what you have to draw a conclusion based on. I would also say that, uh, I mean, it, it, probably goes without saying that the state is going to try and make some argument about why Marquise Davis is either lying or wrong or whatever, but if you think, if you think that's true, you can get his records too. I mean, I, I understand law enforcement didn't talk to him initially, but I disclosed him as a witness in 2017 or so, 
They've had every opportunity to go get his phone records like they did for everybody else. If he didn't leave his house around 8, 8.15, like he said, or, or I guess it would have been about 7.45, got back about 8.30, if that weren't true, his phone records would show that. You could impeach him with that. That would be a means of excluding reasonable doubt about the fact that other people were over there after Mr. Segura left. But, of course, they didn't get that either. Um, in terms of lack of evidence, I also want to talk about the opportunity that, uh, that Mr. Fuchs keeps referring to. Keep talking about Henry's this big, strong guy. Where, where is that evidence? I mean, you can see him. It's not like he's some bodybuilder, right? He wasn't a bodybuilder at the time. No, he's not a little weak like wafy guy either, but there's no evidence about what his physical abilities are. Um, and, and the way that Mr. Fuchs is describing uh, what a welder does is to me kind of indicative of somebody that doesn't do blue collar work like that. Um, welders aren't carrying around giant sheets of, of sheet metal. They have laborers that do that. They're skilled trade workers that stand in a place or on a scaffold or on a high rise or whatever they're working on. And they put the pieces together after the laborer brings them up. Moreover, the only evidence about Mr. Segura's physical abilities at that time indicate that he had recently undergone an invasive intestinal surgery to remove a bullet. That's why he's got that big nine-inch scar on his stomach. You don't have to go to, back to this, fine. That's why he's got that big scar on his stomach right there. And remember, both Mr. Segura and his friend Adam Thornton testified that Mr. Segura was not yet back to a full workload on the jobs that they were doing. So all this talk about he's got opportunity because he's the Incredible Hulk is just inconsistent with the evidence that's before you. I also want to talk about a, uh, a lack of admissions um, by Mr. Segura. So I know that there's Kelsey Kennard, and we'll talk about that. Um, but remember what uh, Investigator Johnson said about the fact that Mr. Segura's vehicle was like wiretapped or bugged or whatever for eight or ten months, and they didn't get a single admission at any point in any conversation with anybody during that time. So in the eight, ten months following the murder, before he goes up to Minnesota to work on those jobs, doesn't talk to anybody, doesn't make any admissions to anybody, but the second he gets to Minnesota, he can't stop writing raps and telling people about all the, the children that he's killed. That, that doesn't make sense. That's inconsistent with common sense. Um, another point that I would try to make is, uh, you know, regarding the, the lack of evidence pertaining to admissions, the state came back in the rebuttal case and tried to suggest that Mr. Segura had secret knowledge of facts of the case were not readily disclosed to the public. I would first say that it defies common sense to think that the family members of the victims are not going to immediately ask how they died and that law enforcement would not immediately tell them how they died. Now, if I knew they were going to make that suggestion, I would have just called Pine, but I didn't, so I didn't. What I can rely on, though, is the burden of proof. Because what would the best evidence that Pine, Marguerite Douglas, did not tell Mr. Segura that day, the 20th, that the children were drowned? What, what, what would the best evidence of that be? probably call Margaret Douglas herself, right? She's here. We all, we all know who she is. She was interviewed in this case. That would be the best evidence. If you're the party with the burden of proof and you're trying to actually exclude reasonable doubt, you probably want to go get her rather than suggesting that's what happened with witnesses who don't have firsthand knowledge. I'd also like to mention in terms of the lack of evidence, the lack of follow-up on other potential suspects. Back in 2011, remember TPD conducted a confidential informant operation where they sent Gregory Washington as a CI to talk to his cousin, DeMario Paramore. Lieutenant Basio at the time was listening over a wire to their conversation, and upon some prompting and being reminded with his report, he admitted that he heard Mr. Paramore admit to having participated in these murders. That was the quote. I know it was phrased a little bit differently during the state's case, for any of these things, if you have factual questions about them, don't rely on me and don't rely on him. You can ask the court reporter to read back any portion of any of the evidence to you. So if there's a dispute about that, you don't have notes, you don't have a recollection, just ask. You can hear anything you want. Uh, what Basio actually said upon prompting on cross was that, yeah, Mr. Paramore admitted to having participated in the murders and explained why they killed the kids. Dead men don't talk. That was the quote. Lieutenant Basio had to admit also, though, that he never bothered to talk to any of Mr. Paramore's alibi, witness, uh, alibi witnesses. He had to admit that he never, never bothered to get his phone records. He had to admit that they never bothered, bothered to send off his DNA buckle swab until I kind of gave him a hard time about that at a deposition in 2016. And even at that point, he didn't follow up to make sure they tested it against the, the, the appropriate number of exhibits. 
He just made sure it was sent off and, and left it at that. And there was no testimony elicited from any of the FDLE experts or McElfresh or anybody else about what, if any, comparison was done between Paramore's buckle swab and any of the evidentiary exhibits. And then last, as it relates to the lack of evidence, I'd like to talk about briefly Tyra Wilcoxon here. So the starting point with her, of course, is that she's a jaded ex of Mr. Segura. Their last interaction was her calling his wife to say, hey, I'm sleeping with your husband and him kicking her out of the car and leaving her on the side of the road in Georgia. Uh, not a great place to start if you're trying to determine if a witness has bias or an ax to grind, right? Um, what she said when she was testifying under oath before you is that she only called Crime Stoppers in order to make a record in case something happened that she had knowledge about this case. But then she was impeached with prior sworn testimony where she admitted that she had actually hired an attorney, Mr. Waters, to try and sue Crime Stoppers to get the money that she was really after here. That's what motivated her to make these allegations. She was trying to get the Crime Stoppers money. Most importantly though, and this is the biggest point with Tyra Wilcoxon, she said that Mr. Segura came to her house to get this gun on the 16th, that Tuesday, the week of the classic, right? We know that the state has both of Mr. Segura's phones, the records for both of his phones. If that were true, if, it, if his phone records showed that he went to Tyra Wilcoxon's house on Tuesday during the week of the murder, don't you think they would have introduced that evidence? Wouldn't that be good evidence to corroborate what she was saying? Again, they didn't have, they didn't introduce that evidence because that's not what the phone records show. It's their burden to exclude every reasonable doubt. It's their burden to introduce evidence which corroborates their witnesses that they want you to rely on that testimony, and they simply didn't do that. Another, uh, another area where reasonable doubt can arise, as the jury instruction indicated, was conflicts in the evidence. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time here because this kind of bleeds into the evidence itself, but there are a couple of uh, individuals that I'd like to deal with in the conflicts in the evidence section. Mr. Fuchs mentioned Kelsey Kennard. Uh, one of the factors that the court gives you to weigh, and this applies to multiple witnesses in this case, uh, number nine, has the witness been convicted of a felony? Um, or a, crime, a misdemeanor crime of, of dishonesty, but in Mr. Kennard's case, it was, a, it was multiple felonies. He was serving a long federal prison sentence. So that's something that can weigh against his credibility, or should weigh against his credibility. Another factor that you can consider is, has the witness been offered or received any money, preferred treatment, or other benefit in order to get the witness to testify? Well, we know that's the case, right? If there was a stipulation read to you that after he offered that videotape testimony, guess what he got? Motion for substantial assistance, sentence reduction, out of prison. Essentially, his, he got the benefit he wanted. Um, and the instruction says that you're to take special care when evaluating that testimony. And in fact, there's a special instruction that applies specifically to a situation like this, and I'll read that to you as well. You must consider the testimony of some witnesses with more caution than others. For example, a witness who hopes to gain more favorable treatment in his own case may have a reason to make false statement in order to, get to strike a good bargain with the state. This is particularly true when there's no other evidence tending to agree with, that witness, with what that witness says about the defendant. So while a witness of that kind may be entirely truthful when testifying, you should consider his testimony with more caution than the testimony of other witnesses. However, if the testimony of such a witness convinces you beyond a reasonable doubt of the defendant's guilt, or if the other evidence does so, then you should find the defendant guilty. Again, he had already received a sentence reduction here, and the jury instructions specifically tell you to give special care when evaluating his testimony. Uh, another of the factors that Judge Hankinson has instructed you to consider when weighing the credibility of a witness, uh, witness's statements and testimony is whether the witness at some point made other statements that were inconsistent with the testimony offered in court. In the, the video that you saw played here in court, Mr. Kennard said Mr. Segura admitted to killing three children. He said that he drowned two and shot one. He said the kids came home while he was killing Brandy. Lieutenant Basio, his video was played on the back side of that, and I know it was quick, so if you didn't get notes about it, if you don't remember it, you can ask to come back out and watch it again. What Lieutenant Basio said is, Kennard didn't say anything about kids during his interview at the prison back near the time of the offenses. A pretty important detail not to tell somebody when they come all the way to Texas, I think it was, to interview you. Um, Lieutenant Basio also said that Kennard offered absolutely no other details about the nature of the killings. Nothing about kids drowning, nothing about kids coming home, nothing about shooting, at least as it pertains to the kids. He said Brandy was shot. 
Um, another factor that the court has instructed you to consider, and, and this applies in Mr. Kennard's case as well, is does the witness's testimony agree with the other testimony and evidence introduced? Mr. Fuchs pointed to the fact that Mr. Kennard said at one point during his video testimony uh, that he killed the baby mama because of child support. Well, I don't know how, care again, it was quick, so I don't know if you caught that, but he also said that one of the reasons was that she had a drug debt, and he was trying to say that there was some sort of drug debt with Mr. Segura. What that should indicate to you is that he's just pulling media reports from anywhere he can get them, mangling everything together and trying to give something that sounds credible or believable. Um, beyond that, I mean, there, there's additional evidence that uh, is readily disprovable that Mr. Kennard uh, provided. So one of those things, one of those pieces of evidence that's readily disprovable is that he hid a gun or the gun in the engine block or around the en engine block of this Monte Carlo. Okay, so the, the Monte Carlo was subject to a search warrant. It was seized in 2010. They still got it. It's still at TPD in their impound lot or at whatever, you know, uh, tow yard that they subcontract with. They got it. Okay, so if that gun is in that car, they could go get it right now and get it before rebuttal. But, of course, they never did that, and they don't have that evidence because that isn't true. Uh, another thing to consider as it relates to the Monte Carlo and the text message that Mr. Fuchs pointed out about getting rid of the, of the Monte Carlo, again, it's stolen. Its VIN is on the engine block. If it's not stolen, that'd be pretty good evidence, right? If Mr. Segura is trying to get rid of this car that Mr. Kennard is suggesting is involved in the murder as a hiding place, and it's not stolen, that would completely undercut his explanation. They've had nine years to run the VIN and see if it is, in fact, stolen. I can promise you, if it wasn't stolen, you would have heard a witness come in and testify that in order to rebut Mr. Segura's testimony. Another important piece of evidence that is inconsistent with what Mr. Kennard said is the, the weapon that was used. Mr. Kennard said that Henry admitted to having a 9mm gun. Of course, the, the weapon used in this case was a 32 revolver. Uh, Mr. Kennard also said that the kids came home while Brandy was being killed. That's not in any way consistent with what the physical evidence shows. That's not possible in light of the physical evidence, is what I mean to say there. So the exchange that took place back in the bedroom, that's relatively quick. Right, because there's not a lot of bloodletting back there. She doesn't suffer any significant injuries back there. There's a struggle over the phone. There's two shots fired into the bathroom. There's one shot <coughs> fired out the window. There's a shot back towards the door to the bedroom that goes into the closet. And then there's a struggle down the hall, but Brandy makes it outside. If at any point the kids are walking across the street while the stuff in the bedroom is happening, they're probably going to notice a bullet smashing the window and coming out the house. Even if they don't have the judgment to stop right there, where is the beating taking place? immediately inside the front door. And how did the police find the front door? Locked. All of that is inconsistent with what Mr. Kennard claims about the kids coming home and, uh, and walking in on the murder taking place. On top of that, think about where Tania is shot. You know, she's not shot in the face as soon as she walks in the door. It's on a couch or near the couch, which is, you know, several, probably like 8, 10, 12 feet past the tile foyer area. That couch is saturated with her blood, and that's her only injury. So we know she's well inside the house um, when she's shot. Another piece of evidence indicating that uh, the kids did not come home and walk in on this murder is the clothes they were wearing. We're talking about the same type of time of year we're talking about now, right? It's cold outside. Anybody notice that? Javante was barefoot and had no shirt on. He just had his corduroys on. Is that consistent with him having just walked back across the street from eating dinner at the neighbor's house? Similarly, Faya is wearing little pink shorts and a little tank top, and she had those pink slippers uh, that were cast off at various points in the living room as well. Again, given how cold it is outside, uh, I would suggest that the evidence is inconsistent with the notion that she had just walked back across the street in a little tank top and shorts for meat and dinner at the neighbor's house. Another witness that I'd like to discuss under the you know conflict in the evidence uh, section of the analysis is, is Kevin Mappa for us. You can go to that collective paragraph there. Okay, so there's, there's a number of points to make with, uh, with Mr. McElfresh. The first point that I'd want to make here is, 
yes, he's paid. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he's any less credible. That's one of the factors that you can consider. The, the court instructed you about that. But that's true of any expert that testifies, right? They should be paid for their time. That's what they do for a living. The thing that, that it was kind of shady about uh, Mr. McElfresh is he's the only expert that tried to fudge what his time and, and therefore money earned on the case was. On direct examination, he says, oh, I've worked eight to 10 hours. Then on cross, I remind him, well, you said eight to 10 hours last November when I was deposing you. By the time we didn't get done going around and around about when he worked, when he came up to Tallahassee and all this kind of stuff, it's closer to 30 hours. And oh, I thought it's time analysis, uh, you know, time spent actually working on the case versus traveling, blah, blah, blah. It's 30 hours or roughly th thereabouts. He's the only one that had a problem uh, downplaying the amount of time that he had spent on the case. Obviously, another question to consider with him is whether his testimony agrees with the other testimony and evidence offered in the case. So Joe Allen Brown and Kevin Oppinger both testified that Brandy, the twins, and Javante are all included as contributors to the mixture of DNA fr obtained from the swab of the bath bar. And this is the profiler uh, swab of the bath, the electropharogram swab of the bath bar right there. Joel and Brown and Kevin Noppinger say that because Javante's DNA is present, you can't make any determination about Henry's potential con contribution to the mixture. A good example of why that sound analysis can be seen by looking at Brandy Peters' mother. Remember what Joel and Brown and, and Kevin Noppinger said about that. Because Brandy is a contributor to that mixture, when they ran Brandy's mother's profile against that, they couldn't exclude her either, right? That's something that you should consider as it relates to Mr. Segur. Anytime Javante is present, it's going to be difficult, if not impossible, to make a determination about Mr. Segura's uh, contribution to that mixture. Another thing to consider with respect to this mixture is that there are only two foreign alleles in the entire data set here. So there's this 12 down here at D5, which is a start allele, and then there's that. Uh, 16 there at D8, which is also a start allele. Uh, a couple of important points to make about that. First of all, I would ask you to recall Joel and Brown's testimony. It was actually from Mr. Fuchs' first direct of her. Hopefully some of you took notes about that. What she said about frequency of occurrence when you're only looking at one or two allele is that the frequency of occurrence on that could be one and two. Half the population could be included. Now, she didn't do a statistical calculation, but she's given you a rough idea. When you're working with one or two allele in a big data set like this, that doesn't tell you a whole lot, uh, even if it was potentially his DNA. So th that's not something that tends to lend itself to uh, reliable interpretation. Uh, it's also important to remember, I would submit, that Mr. McElfresh did his interpretation with knowledge that the state wanted a particular result. Remember what his testimony was. So he's hired in 2016. They want him to look at all the complex mixtures. He looks at all the complex mixtures. He gets paid to do so. He opines at the time that the only exhibit about which he can offer additional testimony is the swab of the phone cradle. Only after the state calls him and specifically says, can you do something different with the swab of this bath bar, does he say, oh, you know what? As a matter of fact, I can do something different with that bath bar. And let me guess what you want me to do. Henry Segura included? Boom. There you go. Henry Segura is included. It's important to remember what Joel and Brown said about unbiased testing. Remember what she did? Before she got standards for all these other people, she did her analysis. She determined what she thought was there before she was looking for people, before she was looking for known potential contributors. What really blows up Michael Fresh's testimony on... Uh, uh, on the, the bath bar interpretation, though, is what Mr. Bundy testified to. So we'll stay on this electropharogram for a minute here. First things first, I had all the witnesses testify, all the DNA witnesses testify to this, including McElfresh himself, but Swigdam, first and foremost. What everybody admitted Swigdam requires is that any analyst interpreting data out of a particular lab use that lab's interpretive guidelines. FDLE's interpretive guidelines prevent analysts from doing inclusion on less than 100 RFUs. And that's important. Here's why. Analysis, reliable analysis, is based on two factors. Of course, like Mr. McElfresh said, it's based on the experience of the person doing the analysis. But just as important, it's based on knowledge of the instruments being used. 
and Mr. McElfresh has absolutely no specialized knowledge of the instruments being used. This is an important distinction to make. He does have specialized knowledge of how these molecules work. He was part of the working group that helped identify which markers they were going to use for DNA comparison. That doesn't have anything to do with the profiler validation, either at the developmental stage, which is where the manufacturer goes through and does all, this test, all these tests to ensure that the instrument is reliable, or at the lab validation phase, where they test their instruments under certain conditions and make sure that they're reliable. And what FDLE said, based on all of their testing, was that you can't do reliable analysis at less than 100 RFUs. Mr. Bundy also said that when you're looking at the sample, the first problem you're going to run into if you're trying to do inclusion on any male is the quantity of male DNA present here. Remember what each of the analysts testified to about the amylogenin marker here. That's the gender marker here with the XY. All of them said amylogenin is going to be the highest quantitative value, the most accurate representation of the amount of biological matter present for each of the contributors. At the largest and easiest to amplify locus, amylogenin, we have 1,041 for the X, which is the female marker, and only 85 for the male. At the best locus, males, whoever the male is, is only showing up at 85 RFUs, which is going to make trying to include a male at any, any of these other loci virtually impossible. And that's what Mr. Bundy said was the, one of the first problems with what Mr. McElfresh had done here. The second problem, and this is obviously indicative of the reason uh, why SWIBDAM requires analysts to use the specific guidelines developed for use in a particular lab, Mr. Bundy says this 14 right here is a rock sty peak. What that means, again, in case you didn't get notes, I know that part's kind of complicated. The way that they amplify this biological material is they use different colored dyes. Sometimes the dye from this row of the electroparogram will bleed down here and it will cre create a steady uh, peak pattern throughout the entire third row. Because Mr. McElfresh doesn't have any specialized knowledge of FDLE's instruments, he didn't know that that was a rock style peak. And so he used it when it shouldn't have been used at all. Another problem that he, that he uh, another problem with Mr. McElfresh uh, and his analysis as it relates to this, um, this uh, evidentiary exhibit here is that he's, of course, using start allele, and we've talked a lot about that. You can't do analysis, inclusion analysis on uh, peaks that are lower than 100 RFUs. Another problem that he had is that after he did uh, inclusion at, at whatever locus he was going to do it at, he used FDLE's frequency of occurrence tables to give you statistics, 700 billion times more likely. What's the problem with that? Mr. Bundy said those frequency of occurrence tables are based on frequency of occurrence, and I guess let me kind of back up and tell you what that means. So what they're talking about when they say fre frequency of occurrence, that deals with how commonly are you going to see a 7 at D5? 1 in 600, 1 in 600,000. But the important thing as it relates to this exhibit is the frequency of occurrence tables are based on frequency of occurrence in unrelated individuals. You can't use those tables when you have multiple related individuals contributing to the mixture as you do in this case. That leads not only to inaccurate analysis, but inaccurate statistical reporting. Another problem here, as Mr. Bundy indicated, is that Mr. McElfresh is doing inclusion at locus where there's absolutely no indication of contribution by anybody else, let alone a male. So a good example of that is at D3. So all of these analysts testified to the fact that peak proportions are generally indicative of DNA coming from a single person. So here we have peak proportions that are almost identical. You have a 15 at B3 and a 17 at D3 at 245 and 246 RFUs, respectively. That's one of the locusts that Mr. McElfresh is using to do inclusion statistics there, and that's not a reliable method of uh, DNA interpretation. Last, Mr. McElfresh only had part of the information. He was only relying on this profiler electropharogram. In 2015, remember I introduced this exhibit through Mr. Uh, Bundy. In 2015, the swab of the bath bar was rerun on a more modern kit on Identifiler Plus. We have that electropharogram. With the more modern kit, what do we notice? The 12 he was calling down here, D5, drops out altogether. What about the 16 at D8? It's dropped out altogether. Those were the only two foreign alleles. Now, these are in two different places, so let me point this out for you. This is where the 12 would have been. 
on the last electroferogram down here, D5, it's dropped out. Up there at the top left, you see that the 16 is dropped out as well. This is a more modern kit, and it reveals exactly what FDLE guidelines are designed to prevent, calling peaks that aren't real peaks. That's why they have that rule. It leads to false inclusion. Now, I know I'm covering a lot of stuff. Some of this is really boring. I'm sorry. I only get one chance to talk to you, so I have to cover it all. Obviously, this is a very important case. The last thing I need to talk about is reasonable doubt based on the evidence itself. Remember, reasonable doubt can arise based on the evidence, lack of the evidence, or uh, conflict in the evidence. We've made it to the last section. I know you're all thrilled about that. The evidence. What does the evidence itself show? First, let's talk about time of death. The medical examiner did not say, and you can read it back, she said it multiple times, did not say a couple hours. That's not what she said. Dr. Flanagan said that the food in the victim's stomach was digesting for a few hours. A subtle difference, but an important difference, because we're talking about closed timelines here. Here's why that's important. Mr. Fuchs knows he doesn't have any evidence that's even moderately inconsistent with what Artron Simmons and Mar uh, Marquise Davis say. And so, the closer back in time we can move that timeline, the less bad it looks for the state. So let's talk about each of those guys uh, one at a time. So Marquise Davis, he says that he fed the twins and Javante oxtail soup at 7 or 7.30. That was his unrebutted testimony. The state has absolutely no evidence which excludes the reasonable doubt created by that testimony. Their, their obligation is not to introduce evidence inconsistent with reasonable doubt. Their obligation is not even to present evidence more believable than evidence th that creates a reasonable doubt. They have to exclude reasonable doubt, disprove, eliminate reasonable doubt. They don't ha even have evidence that's inconsistent with what Marquise Davis says. And I suppose when Mr. Fuchs gets back up, he'll have some arguments, not evidence, but arguments as to why Mr. Davis shouldn't be believed. Why? I can't think of a single reason why. I encourage you to try and think of one if you can. Why would Marquise Davis lie on behalf of Henry Segura? They don't know each other. They've never even met each other directly. Mr. Davis cared for Brandy and her kids. Miss Peters was his girlfriend at the time, fiance at the time, her best friend. He took care of the girls in Javante two, three nights a week, fed them dinner. Why would he lie for some guy he doesn't even know? That defies common sense. He has absolutely no reason to offer false testimony in this case. His sole motivation is that he's been called to testify truthfully and he's offered that testimony. I would also submit to you that Mr. Fuchs mistakenly mischaracterized what Artron Timmons' testimony was. And I'll remind you, and if there's any dispute about it, if you don't remember, if you don't have notes, go ask the court reporter. What Artron Timmons said when he got up the first time was exactly what Marquise Davis said. He said the girls in Javante ate dinner at their house about 7 o'clock. Mr. Fuchs had to call him back to try to correct that. Remember, he gave him a statement. Well, this says right here that your mom, uh, you, you all called the kids back over about 545. Good, okay, no more questions. Then I got up, read the next line of your statement. What's that say? Oh, at 615, my mom sent me to get paper plates so that we could actually feed the kids. He's 14, he ain't got a driver's license. He's gotta go at least half a mile to whatever store he's going to to get the paper plates. And when I asked him the next question, What's the answer? When did you get back with the paper plates? I don't know, 7, 7.30? That's the unrebutted evidence about when their last meal was. And you have to take Dr. Flanagan at her word. She certainly ain't gonna lie for the defense. She said a few hours from their last meal. That puts the time of death 10, 10, 30, 11 at the very earliest. Why is that significant? Everybody agrees. Corbett agrees. Sawicki agrees. Henry agrees. Everybody agrees. Henry's back down in Woodville by 9.30 p.m., never comes back up anywhere near Brandy's house that night. That was the undisputed, unrebutted testimony by both cell phone experts. And it's not as if either of his cell phones are just sitting there unattended. Remember what Corbett said Henry was doing for the rest of the night. He's sitting there texting with Natasha Hawthorne, trying to set up his next hookup. I would submit to you that the, that the combination of the time of death with Mr. Segura's activities that e evening by themselves conclusively rebut any idea that he could have been involved in the commission of the offenses. We also have eyewitness observations, which at least circumstantially corroborate uh, what Mr. Davis and what Mr. Timmons says. 
Uh, number one, Marquise Davis again testified that he saw a dark colored SUV in Ms. Peters' driveway when he got home. Henry's gone by then. Remember the phone records show him on Paul Russell Road at 8.21 p.m. There's a communication on his phone. And, and when Marquise Davis gets back to his own house at 8.30, he sees this dark colored SUV. Does that mean that the person in the dark colored SUV is killing Brandy and the kids? No. Remember the food in the stomach says they got to be alive till about 10.30 at the earliest. But what it does mean is that if somebody else is visiting her, there's a reason why she's not using her cell phone, which the state is pointing to as their only piece of evidence to suggest that she was dead earlier than what uh, Dr. Flanagan is requiring her to be dead. Uh, Dahana Scott, another, uh, another witness, uh, uh, neighbor of Brandy Peters, says when she gets home at 11 p.m., she sees a white SUV in Brandy's driveway. Uh, I don't really know if the state's trying to do something by introducing a picture of Brandy's mom's car, eliciting testimony that Brandy's mom has a white SUV. Nobody said anything about Brandy's mom being over at Brandy's house at 11 o'clock on the night of the murders. If Brandy's mom was there, she would have gone inside or you know, not been able to get a hold of anybody, and she would have called the police, presumably. In any event, there's no evidence about her being there, and any suggestion that she's there is simply based on conjecture and not evidence, and again, state's burden, introduce evidence, not simply get up here and talk. Then you have Darius Mount, who corroborates what the Hannah Scott says about the dogs going crazy, barking right at Brandy's house, so crazy and so out of the ordinary that he calls the police that night. All of these things, while individually not conclusive, are circumstantial pieces of evidence. We've also talked about the kids' clothes. While Brandy's clothes are certainly indicative of you know, stuff that you would normally wear during the day, and so are Tania's, Tamaya and Javante's are not in any way. And again, remember, this is Friday. This is a uh, holiday weekend. They're probably staying up later than normal. At least two of the kids are dressed for bed, and that's something that you can take into account when you're weighing the time of death. And then lastly, remember the testimony that the, the twins' TV in their bedroom was on when officers came in the house. If they're just coming across back from the street and they're walking in on a murder, I doubt they're going to have time to go in their bedroom and flip the TV on before they get killed. That's just another piece of circumstantial evidence that you can consider. Another important area of evidence that we have to talk about when we're talking about reasonable doubts based on the evidence is the evidence which tends to indicate that multiple people were involved in the commission of the, the offense. Now, we've talked about the fact that Henry was excluded from all this stuff. Now I'm going to run through these, and I'll do it as efficiently as I can. All of the foreign DNA, that is DNA which is not from Brandy, the twins, Javante, the officers, friends, family. All the foreign DNA found in the house. And not just found in the house, found on murdery surfaces. Keep an eye on that as we go through each of these exhibits. So there's foreign female DNA under Brandy's fingernails. We've talked about that. I'd like to stop there for a second, though. What do you think the state would be saying if it was Henry's DNA under Brandy's fingernails? You need not look at another exhibit. Brandy's calling to you from beyond the grave. Brandy's sending you a message from the on, beyond the grave. We have, we have foreign female DNA under her fingernails. Ah, and maybe it's a, it's a nail tech. I don't know. Don't worry about that. That's not sufficient when you got the burden of proof. You have to do something to show. If you have an idea about where you think it's from, you got to introduce evidence to do that. In the absence of evidence, what we have is foreign female DNA identified by their expert, as it were, uh, underneath her fingernails. There's foreign female DNA on the interior front doorknob as well, which, again, that's significant because it was locked. That states Exhibit 22. There's foreign male DNA on the swab of the back of the shovel. We don't know definitively that that shovel has anything to do with this. We don't know if it was there the whole time. We don't know for sure that it was a murder weapon. Uh, Mr. Knox said it didn't appear to have been used as anything. Um, and there wasn't spatter on it consistent with it having been on the floor the whole time. What we do know, however, and this is relevant, Mr. Fuchs said, why is it there? Kids bring weird stuff inside. Not these kids. Their DNA was excluded from being a contributor to the mixture on the shovel. That's important to keep in mind as well. So it excludes Mr. Segura. It excludes the kids. There's foreign male DNA on the shovel. That's uh, States Exhibit 76, area number five. There's foreign DNA on the phone plug in the kitchen, which I believe, again, was also unplugged. Brandy, Henry, the police, Brandy's family and friends are all excluded from that. There's foreign DNA on the purse in Brandy's bedroom. Again, that's dumped out. Uh, that's State's Exhibit 32. There's foreign DNA on the contents of the purse. Um, uh, there's five, area of the wallet, five areas of the wallet that were swabbed, like we talked about before, on Area 1. Brandy and the twins were included. Henry and Javante are excluded. Foreign male DNA was identified on area number two. Foreign male DNA was found again. Brandy was the major contributor. The twins, Javante, Henry, all excluded. 
Area number three of the wallet, foreign female DNA was found. Brandy was included in the mixture. The twins, Javante and Henry, all excluded. Area number four, it was indeterminate because Javante uh, and, uh, was a potential contributor to the mixture and so no determination could be made about Henry. But as it relates to area number five, foreign male DNA is found again. Brandy is included. The twins, Javante and Henry, all excluded. And this is significant because again, it's not just some random you know, item, it's an item that appears to have been picked up, everything's dumped out of it and rifled through. So that's something that you can take into account as well. Um, as it relates to the blood, the blood droplet that's outside the common bathroom on the, uh, on the carpet right there, the twins were the major contributor to that droplet, uh, but there's foreign DNA in that droplet as well. Brandy, Javante, Henry, all excluded. And again, this is important because it's consistent with the other droplet on the tile out in the foyer that appears not to have uh, been deposited by brandy, it's not blood spatter, uh, uh, it's not impact spatter, I mean, it's not cast off, it's a, a downward, straight downward blood droplet on the, uh, on the tile out there. Uh, that was state's exhibit number 17. On the projectile discovered in the hallway, this one's important as well. Only foreign DNA is found on that. Brandy's excluded. Remember, this is the shot that's fired from the bedroom and into the hallway closet. Brandy's excluded. The twins are excluded. Javante's excluded. All the officers, families, friends, excluded. Uh, only foreign DNA is uh, noted on that. That's State's Exhibit 26. On the swab of the bathroom faucet in the common bedroom, uh, common bathroom where the kids were found, foreign, fe uh, foreign DNA discovered again. All four victims were included, but Henry's excluded. On the swab of the exterior doorknob going into that bathroom where the kids were found, um, again, Henry and Javante, all the officers excluded, and uh, foreign male DNA noted. On the, uh, likewise, on the bloody collared shirt from Jack McLean Park, uh, d the touch DNA developed by Diane Guzman revealed foreign male DNA. All four victims and Mr. Segura were again excluded there. Another important piece of evidence or, or, or type of evidence uh, that I would say gives rise to a reasonable doubt when you're talking about doubt based on the evidence is evidence indicating multiple weapons being used. So, as Mr. Fuchs indicated, we've got multiple shots being fired by the 32 revolver. Um, we've got four shots at least fired in the bedroom, two in the bath. Remember, there's two in the master uh, bathroom. Uh, one of those strikes the shower, one of those strikes the toilet. We've got one that goes out the window, that's three shots. We've got one that, uh, that goes into the hallway closet. Uh, it's important to note that the one that goes into the hallway closet couldn't have been the one that struck Brandy, if any struck her in the bedroom, because it doesn't have her blood or DNA on it. There's only foreign DNA on that projectile. Um, and, you know, she's shot eight times, so we're potentially at that point at 12 shots, and then Tanaya was shot as well. So that puts us at potentially as many as 13 shots, which would have required the assailants to reload twice. In the best case scenario for the state, they have to reload once. The reason that, that that's significant, again, it's a, it's a prolonged dynamic struggle with Ms. Peters. Uh, if somebody's having to grapple with her, fight with her, strike her, they're probably not going to be able to calmly reload their revolver, which is you know much more difficult than a semi-automatic. And again, dump all those shell casings out, not drop them on the floor, put them in a pocket or a bag or something else. There's none of those on the ground anywhere. And then reload the gun and fire more shots. Uh, we also have a circular weapon uh, being used and the, the wound patterns are consistent with that according to Mr. Knox. You can go to that uh, first autopsy show. All right, so. This one's significant uh, and important because this was the one that both Knox and Mr. Lafort said can't have been deposited by a firearm. There isn't a firearm that has, uh, you know, like a four centimeter perfectly round shape like that. It, it has to correspond to the type of weapon that would have uh, caused the injury, and, and that injury, uh, according to both experts, is not is not consistent with uh, having come from a firearm. Now, I think it's important to draw a, a distinction between what Dr. Flanagan is doing and what uh, Mr. Knox and, and to some extent Mr. Lafort were doing. Dr. Flanagan is looking only at the wounds, right? And so the, the best testimony she could offer for the state is sure, these are consistent with having come from a firearm. That's possible. And yes, it is consistent with any number of other weapons. Again, state's obligation is to exclude every reasonable doubt, not introduce one possible version of the events. That's the first problem. Second problem, she's only looking at wounds. She's not looking at cast off. 
She's not looking at um, you know, the, the, the kinetics and, and physics involved in inflicting these wounds relative to the crime scene. She's only considering one piece of the puzzle. So when she says it's consistent, that shouldn't carry as much weight, I would submit, as when people qualified to testify in all the forensic, the forensic disciplines offer their own opinions on that topic. Um, another thing to keep in mind as we go to the next wound here, we see this oval injury to the forehead. We go to the next one. Again, oval injury. Remember what uh, Calvin Moore said when he was testifying. He offered this voluntarily. The state was trying to get him to say, yeah, that looks like the 32 that I saw Henry with, and he voluntarily offered. Yeah, but the butt on that one was more square. Remember him saying that? That's inconsistent, certainly, with the round one, and then obviously with this oval-shaped uh, injury as well. The next type of injury we have are the teardrop injuries that Mr. Knox pointed to on the other side of Brandy's head. Um, after that, we have the crescent-shaped lacerations. Uh, these are the straight ones here that we're looking at, um, which, again, we're, we're going to be corresponding to the shape of whatever object, is some sort of straight object that struck her. That's, uh, these are more of the straight injuries that Mr. Knox was referring to. This is one of the crescent-shaped ones. Now, again, uh, Mr. Knox was not saying that these injuries could not possibly have come from a firearm. Uh, what he's saying is that based on his wealth of experience, all of his training, all of his experience, all of his education, and all of these forensic disciplines, that's not the most likely explanation. The most likely explanation is that some different weapons are used. And we know at least a couple of different weapons are used because both he and LaFort opine that, okay, we know a gun's used because she's shot a bunch of times, but also some object of at least a couple of feet in length has to be used. So that's two different objects right there, and there's no indication that... Uh, one person would have been uh, able to wield both of those as this prolonged dynamic struggle is ongoing. Uh, another piece of evidence that's consistent with their opinion is that as you go outside the home, we may have passed these, but... Oh, actually, let's go through these first. Go back one slide. Okay, so uh, as they talked about the blood spatter analysis, I want to remind you of a couple of things. So this cast-off spatter here at the top of the door, Mr. Knox said was from cast off from some long object coming down like this. And as it came forward, it was slinging the blood. That's why there's high volume. That's why there's high height. What he and Mr. LaFort also said is that there's upward traveling cast off right there. Consistent. And it goes up, it actually goes up under that curtain right there on the door. That's consistent with backward motion. So you've got one person standing on this side of the door moving forward. You've got another person on this side facing this way, and their, their weapon is going backwards. So you have cast off consistent with two different positions by two different people there. Same thing as you look at the east wall here. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so on the east wall here, again, Mr. Knox said that this was uh, impact that spatter consistent with downward motion from a weapon. The person would have been facing that east wall. That's consistent, again, with the void pattern in the spatter on the west wall. Remember how we talked about that west wall wasn't covered in spatter like the front door was and like the east wall was. Again, that's consistent with mul multiple people being in multiple locations. Of course, uh, none of those opinions exclude, and Mr. Knox acknowledged that, none of those opinions exclude the possibility that this is one person moving into different locations. But in light of all of the evidence, he didn't find that to be most likely. Um, what I would submit is the most compelling evidence that multiple people were involved is the shoe impression evidence. Um, you know, as you go back and you deliberate, you know, you're going to have an opportunity to talk about how credible each of these witnesses are and were. I would submit to you that Mr. Knox was the most credible witness either party called. He wasn't married to one opinion. He didn't try to go too far for the, he just told you what it was. And his, his, his credentials are impeccable. He's, he's the only person that's qualified to testify about each of the areas of forensics that we discussed. And his opinion was that these are five different shoe impressions or probable shoe impressions. Could he say definitively, yes, these are absolutely shoe impressions? No, he didn't try to say that. He said, based on my experience, my training, my education, each of these are most likely shoe impressions. What he said beyond that is that, number one, the officers are excluded from having deposited each of these, and number two, these are each different from the other. <coughs> these are five separate distinct shoe impressions. Like, I don't know, to me that's the end. 
What else, like, what else can you do about that? You don't have an expert that says anything different than that. I called the FDLE guy, even though he didn't agree, because I'm just putting in everything in front of you. Right? I'm not afraid of the evidence. I called all the FDLE people. I called all the state experts because I got the evidence in this case. That never happens for a defense attorney. But that's what this case is about. So even though he disagreed with Mr. Knox, I called him, and his opinion was kind of consistent with Mr. Do what Mr. Knox said. He wasn't comfortable saying these are probable shoe impressions. He said they were impressions. None of them were left by law enforcement. That's at least somewhat consistent with what Mr. Knox says. And I would submit that Mr. Knox is the best witness to get that evidence and information from because he is the most qualified and he's the person who has the most training, knowledge, experience, and education dealing with each of these topics. Um, and before moving on from, from this photo, I think it's also important to note, I know it's been a long time, but whoever the evidence tech from TPD was that put down all this Luca crystal violet, remember what she said about why she put it down? Because she thought those were shoe impressions. That's why she did that. That's what she testified to. She thought that as well. Now, she wasn't quite qualified to go do all the shoe impression analysis, but she didn't have to be. She created the evidence. She got the evidence documented, and somebody that was qualified, Mr. Knox, took a look at it. And then we come to Santos' testimony. So uh, I like to think, as I think most attorneys do, that I'm not an idiot, OK? And so what I mean when I say that is I know that Santos has obvious credibility issues. I'm not blind to that fact. I'm not asking you to believe every word he says. I don't believe every single word he says. But the reason I call him is that significant parts of his testimony, material parts of his testimony, are corroborated by other important testimony, more reliable, more objective evidence and testimony. So uh, the first thing that I, that I want to talk about, just in passing, I suppose, is the fact that one of his statements is, is typewritten. Mr. Fuchs keeps coming back to this point. Um, I think it bears mentioning that's what investigators do. Investigators for his side. Mr. Newland's done that in this case, too. That's what they do. That's what they're supposed to do. They go talk to a witness. They, take inter they, they do an interview. They take notes. And then they go make a, a, a typewritten statement based on that interview so it's not all sloppy and ugly looking, so that the attorney reading it can read it, right? That's why they do that. So any suggestion that that's improper is, uh, frankly, simply silly. Uh, going on past that, though, uh, I think there's important pieces that we can talk about here. So I guess I'll talk first about the, uh, the mental health evaluation that Mr. Fuchs referenced. That's funny to look at because you look at the date of the evaluation and the date of the report, it's 731 in August 1. There's a second report from the same guy with the same evaluation date and the same uh, report date that says something totally different. And I quoted that uh, during Santos's cross-examination where it's talking about there's no evidence of any mental illness and uh, he's manipulative basically. He does what he wants to do to advance his own agendas. Uh, does that mean that he's not lying? Certainly not. And, and is there a way to tell what he's being totally truthful about and what he's lying about? No. I mean, like I say, there are pieces of evidence which corroborate some important pieces of his testimony, but we can't tell for certain what all he's being truthful about. So let's talk about the things that can be corroborated. So one piece of evidence that corroborates his testimony, and I understand the timing on this could make it that, you know, it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. He, he hears about it and then offers testimony about it. But the fact is, this guy, Demario Paramore, confessed to a confidential informant on a recorded line, and Lieutenant Basio stated that he heard that uh, confession. That corroborates what Santos says. Again, is that definitive? Certainly not, and that's not the best piece of evidence that I'm going to refer to in supporting parts of Santos' testimony. Another thing that I would ask you to look at, and again, this is just circumstantial, Mr. Fuchs asked a bunch of witnesses about domestic violence. You get very angry. Uh, doesn't that lead to, uh, you know, violence and, and escalating anger? Folks, uh, this ain't baby mama drama stuff. This is the most heinous, violent offense in the history of Tallahassee, right? That's not domestic violence stuff. That's not, oh darn, I gotta pay another 200 bucks a month. That's not what causes that, this offense. That doesn't make a father of four go drown babies. Doesn't make a man who just had sex with this woman go beat her face in. That doesn't make sense. This offense is so violent and so heinous that it tends to be what Dr. Dela Cruz, as quirky and weird as he is, said. This is more consistent with a cartel hit. And I know that sounds kind of too fantastical to be true. I mean, that sounds more like movie-ish. It sounds like throwing something at the wall. But when I get to the most compelling evidence which supports uh, Mr. Santos, I, you know, hopefully you'll see that evidence the way I do. Uh, another piece of, you know, I, I, I suppose, 
circumstantial corroborative evidence is that uh, the spade placed near the body doesn't have spatter on it consistent with being at that location during the murder. And Dr. Dela Cruz testified about the fact that, that if the Zetas are involved, that can often be a calling card indicating their involvement. Uh, one circumstantial point, uh, one additional circumstantial point that should be mentioned is, you know, there, were, there was uh, testimony elicited by the state, okay, Brandy's living in Section 8 housing, where's the money? She got all this cocaine, where's the money? There were grazing references to where the cocaine went. Uh, and, and, you know, you can extrapolate that, but I would submit that, that the mo based on the testimony, the most likely destination for that co cocaine was Kalo. Um, Monica Peters testified about uh, Brandy's relationship with Kalo. Uh, Santos testified about how Kalo was actually in the federal detention center over on Capitol Circle in 2010 at the same time, which puts the timeline for him being federally indicted for uh, cocaine trafficking kind of in the same time frame that Santos was talking about the thefts taking place. Again, uh, Brandy was dating Kalo, and um, she, uh, Javante was rumored to be his child. That's who Henry thought was actually Javante's father. That's who Brandy was leaving him messages about saying Javante's dad is this other guy. So, you know, is that definitive proof? Of course not, but it's one potential explanation based on evidence for where that cocaine went. Um, and we should also talk about, of course, the DNA that links Avila to the scene. Um, and this is another point of contention between Michael Fresh and Joellen Brown and Kevin Noppinger. Um, I think it's important to stop at this point and remind you who Joellen Brown is. She isn't just some hack that, like, I hired. I didn't pay her anything. She's not my witness. She is the, or was at the time, the senior biology analyst at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, Tallahassee Lab. She's their trial horse. She's their war horse. She's the one they ride into battle. Why do you think she got this case? She's the senior analyst. She's the CODIS administrator. She's the one who's in charge of, she's the gatekeeper for people putting evidentiary exhibits into CODIS. Why? Because she knows best. She's got experience doing complex work like this. That's why she got this case in the first place. And it's also important to realize, based on the, the cross-examination the state tried to do, she is the only one who handled this properly. FDLE hid the exculpatory DNA match through CODIS from the state attorney, because the state attorney has an obligation to turn over all exculpatory evidence, and they always do that. Mr. Fuchs does, and Mr. Campbell before him. They hid that in violation of FDLE operating procedures from Mr. Campbell at the time. That was a violation. The only person who followed FDLE operating procedures, as she said, was Joellen Brown. So this suggestion that she was like forced to retire or something, which she was the only person who didn't violate, was frankly patently absurd. And she, she clarified that point herself. So before we talk about the analysis, I just thought it was important for context to understand who Joellen Brown is. Again. She, she's spent her entire career helping law enforcement agencies, helping the state attorney develop evidence for use in criminal cases and helping them secure convictions. Do you really think on the most serious, most heinous, most disturbing, most disgusting case that she's ever handled, just all of a sudden, out of the blue for no reason, she's gonna flip on FDLE and help the guy who may have committed these horrible murders? That doesn't make any sense at all. Her testimony is unbiased. She isn't getting paid. She's a law enforcement witness, a career law enforcement witness, testifying truthfully for the defense because that's what the science most accurately supports. So we have the context now. Uh, and again, as I go through, I'm gonna to refer to her because she's the most credible, but my, my witness, Kevin Noppinger, just kind of said he agreed with everything that she said. So let's talk about what she said relative to the DNA. You can go to that, uh, that slide that, that depicts there we go. Okay. So this was, uh, this was Joellen Brown's analysis. This is not a situation like we were dealing with, with, with the bath bar, where you got two allele. Okay? Look at all these matches. He's a 12 at D8. It's a 12. He's an 810 at D7. You got a 10 plus. He's an 8-9 at THO. You got an 8-9. He's an 11-12 at D13. You got his 12. He's a 9-11 he's a at D18. You got his 11. He's a 1718 of EWA, you got a 17. At, at TPOX, he's a 911, you have his 11. <coughs> at D18, he's a 1518, you got his 18. At D5, he's an 1112, you have his 12. And then this is the significant thing because under the FDLA operating procedures and interpretive guidelines, this is the one that allows you to do inclusion statistics. You have a genotype. A genotype is when you have both allele from a contributor. If you don't have that, you're not allowed to do inclusion. But 
You do. You have a genotype here, and it matches every place else. Yes, there's masking going on. Yes, there's dropout going on. But she isn't violating operating procedures like McElfresh did to arrive at this conclusion. She's not using any start allele. She has a genotype. She's properly and unbiased, in an unbiased fashion, interpreting this DNA evidence based on her training and experience. Now, on top of the DNA analysis by a law enforcement analyst who links uh, Mr. Avila to the scene, remember I had her look at the actual electropharogram, and she looked at it and said, yes, he is included. You have Avila's own testimony and his own behavior. So the first thing we know about Avila, you can go to that first highlighted page there. The first thing we know about Avila is that he's a real drug trafficker, like a Narcos style, you know, whatever movie, site, whatever, TV series. Like, he's a Colombian drug trafficker. He was caught bringing a multi, there you go, 4275 kilograms of high-purity cocaine, $100 million worth of coke into the country on a ship. He's the captain. They catch him, right? So we know he's a real player. His testimony was that except for this a little misunderstanding in the first day of his case, his boss calls his wife, I'm going to kill you. Oh, wait, that was a mistake. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Neither he nor his family are ever in danger. This is the federal judge's order, and this is in evidence. Let's go to the next slide here. What does the federal judge say about him or his family not being in danger? In 2001, Quinones was not at liberty without risking the life or at least the well-being of both himself and his family and his friends to cooperate with the United States. The prospect of retaliation by the criminal enterprise was tangible and eminent, which accounts for his unwillingness to accept responsibility for his crimes. He told you he was never in danger. That's a bold-faced lie. Pretty sure we can rely on the words of a federal judge about what the situation actually was. Another point that we have to look at is that um, Avila claims specifically and repeatedly that he never actually cooperated against any person. Now, he ju I, I just said, you know, my thing. That, that's not true either. The judge says he cooperated conspicuously by, among other things, returning to the courtroom in which he was convicted and sentenced, appearing before the judge who sentenced him, and testifying decisively against one of the princes, if not one of the kings of the Colombian cocaine realm in which he formerly operated. He goes on to say, a review of the transcript of Canona's trial testimony against the guy, his boss there, which fully and accurately discloses his role in the 2000 criminal episodes and earlier episodes. So he's saying, I didn't cooperate against anybody. The federal judge says, okay, buddy, you're a liar. Okay? So we know he's lying. Now, now the, the relevant thing is not that he's lying. It's why is he lying. And the, and the reason I would submit is because these facts go along with the defense theory here. And he knows that. I mean, I'm the one cross-examining him about these points on the video. Look, what I was suggesting there, as you saw yourself, is so you cooperate, you get a motion for substantial assistance, you've now helped them take down this part of the ring. He gets back to Colombia within three days of landing in Colombia. Even though he says all his associates have been arrested, he's contacted by the cartel and they're trying to bring him back in. That's what he says. What I would submit is that his life was in danger at that point because he cooperated as the federal judge said it would have been. And so what does he do? He makes contact with a woman he hasn't seen in 10 years. He does a marriage by phone to her in Italy so that he can get a, a spouse visa, and he hightails it over to Italy, where he stays until after these murders are committed. Now, the state says, hey, look, he completed his college class. He paid his rent in November, and also he doesn't have a passport because no illegal immigrants ever make it into the United States, right? Especially a boat captain. I'm sure he couldn't have found a boat over in order to illegally enter. Further, I'm sure no college student has ever passed a semester's class when they miss a class. That doesn't happen either, right? And then finally, when people go on vacation, they never pay their rent. Obviously, if they're not there, they don't have to pay rent. They don't have to pay their mortgage, right? I say that sarcastically to just to make the point that, look, None of that stuff, none of that supposedly corroborative evidence shows, proves anything of relevance. What we have lies about are the purposes for which the defense introduced this testimony. It's to show that he had a motive to be involved in this murder. It's that he had, remember I talked in an opening statement about wet work. That's what that is. That's why his own quote was, he went back in 2013 after these murders occurred to Columbia and could walk the streets in peace. That's what he said. Why do you think that was? Why do you think he hightailed it out of there with some chick he hadn't met or hadn't seen in 10 years, and then all of a sudden after the murder's going, oh, I can walk the streets in peace after getting a 20-year sentence reduction? Does that definitively prove it? Of course not. But it's circumstantial evidence that points in the direction uh, that I'm suggesting it does. Now, the last thing um, in terms of corroborative evidence relative to Santos that I want to point to 
are <clears throat> uh, some things that show that he was actually, and, and again, this is the most compelling evidence that I was um, referring to, at least from my perspective. We, we know that they were in actual communication. Brandy and Santos were actively communicating with each other. When law enforcement went into her house, <coughs> they searched the place, of course, they seized everything of evidentiary value. They found like seven or eight letters from Santos to Brandy, and these are all sent within like the two weeks leading up to the murder. Um, this right here is the envelope that C.C. Timmons referenced. So the day before the murder, Brandy gets this letter, <laughs> And she comes over to Cece's house, and Cece described her as displaying mannerisms in indicative of her being afraid. This is in evidence. What it says on the back of this envelope is, death before dishonor. Word is bond, bond is life, and a man should give his life before his word fails. Say what you mean, and mean what you say. And it says below that, dear Mr. Mailman, if this letter happens to get lost, just send it to heaven, because it's going to an angel. On the other side, it says, I thank God for you, and I ask that he look out for you and our three little angels. Chilling, right? That's not me telling you Brandy was scared. That's her best friend. Her best friend is telling you she gets that letter. She knows what it means. Remember why this was introduced? It wasn't just that I introduced it. It's that the state's asking Mr. Santos questions. Ah, you don't even know her. What's she look like? Now, how old is she? What, you know, what's her complexion? It's suggesting that you know, he, he doesn't even actually know her. That's not the case. We know that they're in communication. We know it for a fact. Her best friend testified about it. And the other thing that, that, that uh, the communication show is, remember there was some reference to uh, her emailing with Mr. Santos. Now, you may not remember this because it probably didn't seem significant at the time, but what Mr. Santos yet said is that he was using another inmate's Coralinks account, which is the inmate emailing service that they use at the Federal Detention Center to communicate with Brandy. Now, Kayla was using that sometimes as well, but there were specific communications wherein Brandy's response indicates, Santos appears to be talking nonsense, but Brandy's responses indicate she understands the code language that he's using. You know, marriage, remember Santos says that means meeting up with somebody that's the person who you're gonna work with on this job. And so you can go to the emails. These are Brandy's own words. These aren't my words, these aren't Santos' words. These are Brandy's words in the days and weeks leading up to a murder. I'm not trying. Get fucked up about no BS. I need to know what's going on. So before I send a pic or write back, I want to know his real name, date of birth. Is he really there? My life means a lot to me, as well as my three kids. Those are her words. She ain't writing that about Henry Segura. She's writing that back and forth about this guy that Santos is trying to send her to go see. Next one. This is sent just a couple of days before she's killed. Again, this shows that she understands what Santos means with, with that apparently nonsensical code. Tell Kalo that I really, really need to talk to him. These are all in caps, like, like it's depicted here. ASAP. If not, I'm going to do some crazy shit, and I know he don't want that. I'm going crazy right now, so he needs to let me know something, because I don't play with me and my kid's life. These are her words. Who knows best? what Brandy's in danger from. Brandy does. Brandy knows best what Brandy's in danger from. You don't want to believe Santos? Don't believe Santos. Believe Brandy. You don't want to be the, believe the shoe impressions? You don't want to believe the DNA? You don't want to believe the blood spatter? You don't want to believe the cell phone stuff? You don't want to believe Henry? All that's fine. Believe the one person who the state won't cross-examine. Believe the one person who is unimpeachable. Brandy Peters. She knew what she was in danger from. She knew best what she was in danger from. Her words alone, as are many of the other pieces of evidence I've talked about, are reasonable doubt in and of themselves. I appreciate your patience, everybody's patience. I, I know this has been long. I only get one opportunity to talk to you. There's a lot of evidence in this case. This was a you know, two and a half week trial, so there's a lot to cover, and I appreciate that you've all had paid attention to me this entire time. In closing, I just want to emphasize the importance of your job now. You know, um, I, I've thought for a long time that I've carried this burden. We talk about burdens. The state has an evidentiary burden, but you have a burden and I have a burden. And everybody involved in this case has a burden of some sort because it's an important case. There's a lot at stake. 
Children were killed here. An, an innocent mother was killed here. She's got family. They deserve justice. Mr. Segura is a father and a brother and a son and a friend, and he deserves justice. Folks, justice can't start until the search for the right guy or right guys or right people starts. This has been nine years in the coming. Mr. Segura has waited patiently for nine years. I put him on the stand knowing he's not a superstar witness, right? Like You would expect somebody that committed an offense like this to be well-prepared, buttoned up, unflappable. That's not him. I, all I told him was get up there and be real. But you've waited for this moment. Get up there and be real and be you. And they want to try and say because he gets frustrated that he's the killer. Is that your best evidence that he's the killer? He got frustrated? Look, as he told you himself on the stand, he's been in custody for eight years for an offense he didn't commit. Who wouldn't be frustrated under those circumstances? Who wouldn't pop off under those circumstances? He, he doesn't even talk about it in terms of years anymore. He talks about it in terms of inches. His son Trey was this tall when he went in. His son Trey is now a yeah, college football player. Right? You understand my point? His frustration is not in any way evidence of guilt. It's evidence of a man who has waited for you for too long. You're the only ones who can d deliver justice. You have power in your hands now that you've never had and will never have again. You have the power to save. You have the power to take life. I ask that you follow the law that you promised to follow, that you hold the state to its burden, and that you find Mr. Segura not guilty. Debated on timing, but I think we, we have to take a break, I'm sure. So I think what we're going to do is go ahead while we're doing this. Let's take a lunch break. Let's be back and ready to go at 1 o'clock. Don't discuss the case among yourselves or with anyone else. Uh, have a good lunch. Let's go to sidebar, please. The lawyer.